There has been an internal debate in human history over what is the best form of entertainment or pleasure for us. For example, in the past, operas were considered rich people's superior form of entertainment, whereas there are many other forms of entertainment, like watching someone recite a novel or a lot of non-musical plays, which were seen as inferior entertainment given to a lower class of people. And even among genders, men were considered to be indulging in a superior form of cultural or educational entertainment by reading Greek, Latin and ancient texts, whilst women, they read novels and etiquette books, which were much more inferior. And moving to modern day, we do read a lot of news articles that is lamenting how our young generation is being ruined by social media or those short video platforms rather than entertaining themselves with a book or some more um, healthy outdoor activity and we're saying that they're very much collapsing under the proliferation of low value pleasure. From these examples, we've seen that the debate between high and low pleasure has originated centuries and even a millennia ago. And even now, we are still debating on this topic, and this is what I wish to address in this video. There are actually two key questions that I will be addressing. Firstly, on what grounds can we draw the distinction between high and low pleasure, and how do we draw that? And secondly, can this distinction really be made, or should it be? One of the most famous formulations of this difference between high and low pleasure was given by John Stuart Mill. In his essay, Utilitarianism, he discusses different forms and types of utility, and here are two famous quotes that really illustrate his position. The pleasures of the intellect, imagination, and moral sentiments are much higher value than pleasures of mere satisfaction. So this is a direct formulation of his distinction. Secondly, he also says, It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And then we also have older texts such as Plato's Republic, um, and I've also got a past video on that if you're interested in checking out. And this text, it has mentioned a hierarchy of things that we should desire for and placing material or corporal desires at the bottom. And we have um, pleasures of the intellect indulged, especially by philosophers at the top of the hierarchy. Recently, I've also read an article online by Adam Kirsch called Culture as Counterculture. So it's discussing the rise of popular mass entertainment in our age, which has relegated what we typically perceive as high culture that is kind of like canonical novels, operas, poetry, um, classical music, etc., into the status of a counterculture. So one of the claims made in this article is rather interesting. Basically, he writes, High culture remained the superego of a society that still nominally believed in artistic values like genius, originality, beauty, and complexity. Similarly, for Greenberg, Adorno, and MacDonald, in a different ways, high culture remains the standard by which the inferior products of the culture industry can be judged and found wanting. Though they write as analysts, they are really making an appeal. Read Joyce, not James Gold Cousins. Look at Picasso, not Norman Rockwell. Listen to Beethoven, not Chuck Berry. There would be no point in making such an appeal if these critics didn't believe that the general public is capable of preferring the better to the worse, if only they are given the chance. Besides cultural entertainment, there is another commonly understood divide in everyday forms of pleasure. So for example, hiking in the national park is better than spending your day on the couch scrolling through TikTok. Uh, suppressing immediate desires so you could devote your time to self-improvement and realise future plans is better than slumping on the couch and immediately just gaining pleasure from watching TV. So now we're on to the second question, and I would say there are two main dimensions to drawing this distinction. So the first one is class. Forms of cultural entertainment typically associated with the upper class or the well-educated class have remained in our perception as the superior forms. On the other hand, more widely accessible forms of cultural entertainment are relegated a lower class status. That is because they are widely accessible to all classes and in particular consumed by a lower class who have no access to upper class entertainment. This distinction is the remnant of a deeply imbued class consciousness in our society. As the upper class, they do take extraordinary effort to distinguish themselves as superiors, and they do this by branding what they enjoy as superior. The second criterion of division is the utility gained by society as a whole via an individual's enjoyment of a certain pleasure. This division is often paralleled by the time frame it takes to realise or earn that pleasure. More delayed forms of gratification are usually given a higher status. For example, taking drugs or eating junk food are deemed as inferior from, let's say, going to the gym every day or working towards your university degree. In her article, Desire in Heart of Darkness, Jeanette Leake writes, The underlying principle of the law as it operates in Heart of Darkness and the source of its relevance for my reading is imperative to suspend and defer gratification of desire to subordinate the individual will to gratification to the larger corporate, i.e. social will. Moreover, Marshall Berman writes, 
This theme of insatiable desire that drives permanent revolution, infinite development, perpetual creation and renewal in every sphere of life is infused into the life of every modern man by the drives and pressures of the bourgeois economy so that their inner dynamism will reproduce and express in what rhythms by which modern capitalism moves and lives. So to summarise, these two writers posit that one of the driving forces of capitalism is the infinite deferral of desire gratification. People will only participate in the production process if they constantly yearn for things that require more productive effort and a longer time frame to achieve. As a society, we have internalised this dynamic, and this is why we think of pleasures that take more effort to achieve and in the process obviously provide society with more productive benefits as superior. Now we come to the crucial question. And before really discussing this question, I wish to give two examples of objection to the distinction between high and low pleasure. So the first is the position posed by preference satisfaction utilitarianism. So rather than aiming to maximise a specific set of things that either the majority or the government deems the most beneficial to everyone, we should aim to satisfy as many individual preferences as possible. And these preferences are not governed by any sort of rule, they're completely under the idiosyncrasies of individual people. So this position basically breaks down the difference between high and low because we're not saying what people should have, but we're just saying if you want this, then get it. So we're validating all preferences as equally deserving of satisfaction. The next example is given by Herman Hesse in his novel Steppenwolf. He explicitly takes position against this distinction. So the protagonist Harry was originally obsessed with aligning himself only with high culture, so philosophy, um, good literature, classical music, etc. And yet this has rendered his life very unhappy. And throughout the novel, the passages that is basically has his voice urging Harry to move away from this sort of life. So at one point, Harry realises, I no longer have the slightest desire for any kind of knowledge or insight. After all, that was precisely what I had my fill of. Instead, what I was desperately longing for was experience, decisive action, the cut and thrust of life. He was also told, Until now you couldn't stand all this dance music and jazz, it wasn't serious or deep enough for you. But now you've realised that there is no need to take it seriously at all, though it can be very pleasant and delightful. So now we've seen the arguments from both sides. What do we make of them? Should we maintain or erase a line or shift it somewhere else? I'm not going to pretend like I could provide a definitive answer to this. Instead, I want to really just point you out to a few key problems associated with both keeping and removing the line. And that is really for my audience to consider. So if we keep the line, there are two key concerns. And the first concern is that of elitism. Are we really okay with the upper class continuing to assert that um, forms of educated entertainment available only to them are branded as innately superior? And the second is the question of liberty. Are we really giving equal respect and freedom to each individual, and that is what our liberal society values, if we're imposing judgement on what they should enjoy? However, if we wish to remove the line, there are equally two concerns. The first one is about intellectual advancement. It is undeniable that educating yourself in a way that um, allows you to enjoy more complex forms of cultural entertainment really stretches your intellect. It forces you to think more and opens up a wider perspective of the world. So if people stop valuing this form of education, I would be really worrying for our new generation of youth. And the second problem is socioeconomic advancement. As we have acknowledged, more productive forms of pleasure promote the advancement of society, albeit at the expense of deferred desires. Yet if we were to abandon this sort of pursuit altogether, it could be detrimental to the economic welfare of a society. So here is a sum of all I've had to say on the subject of high and low pleasures. I'm keen to hear any of your opinions on this topic in the comments and basically I've left it an open question of whether we should keep the line, remove the line because I personally don't have an answer and I suppose a lot of people don't have an answer either. Of course there are both pros and cons of both keeping and removing the line and perhaps people could think of innovative ideas to shift the line if that would be beneficial. Thank you for watching my video, um, don't forget to like and subscribe if you really enjoyed it and check out my other videos.